The following are excerpts from the never-before-seen manga written by Aaron Sorkin. News Hero, Attack on Demons of Error. Next time on News Hero, Attack on Demons of Error. Jeff Newsroom has been training in 30 times gravity, but will it be enough when he faces off with Republican Congressman Van on his Sunday news chat show? Find out next time on News Hero, Attack on Demons of Error. And now, the news with Jeff Newsroom. We're dealing with a situation where we've been saddled with trillions in debt from the previous liberal administration. I don't want to sell my grandkids to the Chinese. (laughs) So, what you're saying, sir, is that adding to the national debt is borderline treasonous? I would say that, sir. Interesting. Do you also, sir, support the current Republican tax bill? Darn tootin' I do. <laughs> sir Kakarot, are you aware, sir, that the CBO estimates that this tax bill will add several trillion dollars to the national debt? Oh, him, oh. <laughs> then, by your own logic, sir, you are a traitor! are here with Chapo. For those of you wondering what you just heard, it was a little teaser from the Chapo Guide to Revolution audiobook. That was the Aaron Sorkin anime section featuring voice acting by yours truly. <laughs> Think you're better than me, newsman. No, that was a good time. Brendan came back to do that uh, special section for the Chapo audiobook. So a uh, little snatch of that to share with you. Um, again, another uh, another late episode uh hope that's not a problem for you guys i mean i know it's never been in the past but um it was my birthday this weekend and what i say on my birthday goes so mm-hmm. hope you can hope you can live with that but we're Will's a bridezilla yep i'm a birthday birthday uh, bitch it's my it's my birthday mom we yeah. found out that will is the stassi of this show <laughs> i'm the number one girl i'm the number one guy of this group <laughs> um no we all had a uh, a good time yesterday and uh randomly we were able to do some uh, live on the street on the ground reporting about the q phenomenon which has now penetrated the world of uh really shitty williamsburg bushwick street art yeah i was standing outside the place we were at and i saw one of those black and white shepherd fairy style portrait posters plastered on the wall of a, looked like a warehouse and i was across the street and i looked at it and i thought that looks like john f kennedy jr and i thought well, that can't be. That's such a random reference. There's no way that, that even all of these street artists, douchebags who try to do ironic, you know, recapitulations of, of old fashioned, you know, 90s pop culture ephemera or whatever, they're not going to pull John F. Kennedy Jr. out of their ass. That would only make sense if it was Q related. And that's absurd that that would happen. So I walked closer. I wanted to confirm that it just kind of looked like JFK Jr. And I was basically just viewing it through the prism of my broken internet brain but then i got closer and i got close up to it and not only did it look like jfk jr i noticed that it had in its ear a earring shaped like a q confirming beyond a doubt that it was QAnon street art so the thing has broken containment it's no longer within the confines of its creators or the dumbasses who follow it it's now being turned into culture by by the carrion eaters of, of <laughs> northern Brooklyn. I I mean I look all art is political, 
everything's political. Super Smash Brother tournaments are political. <laughs> it's political when you shit on your doo doo ass <laughs> and first thing in the morning, and you have to like rinse the shit out of your underwear and leave it on your towel rack till it dries out, like everyone does. That's political. And yeah, no, it's reactionary art. But can we not admit that Q street art is kind of an improvement over what we have in that area? It's like you either have, it's like a, a girl, it'll be like a girl, but she's made out of flowers and she's smoking a pipe and the cloud of smoke just says like Brooklyn, but with no, <laughs> with no vowels. And yeah. it's like, cool. Or then, or it will be like uh, a mural of, you know, fucking Coolio. And it will be like Brooklyn state of mind. <laughs> and it's by someone who is born in uh the last remaining plantation <laughs> like his parents owned a plantation in north carolina and he moved here because he was like i've just always belonged in brooklyn what's so, the worst like, one the, the the snoopy tweeting but he's like tied off or whatever yeah, oh yeah, yeah that's yeah. it i was just gonna yeah. say there's a mural in bushwick that is snoopy and charlie brown strung out with spikes in their arms but the spikes have the twitter logo on them mm. and charlie brown is saying to snoopy how many likes do we get? Because they're addicted. That's to that's, social media. that's well, the, it's like you, the f, the f, the spoon is your phone. Yeah, <laughs> that yeah. is the third category of street art. Yeah, it will be like you know dropping fat man little boy on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, except there's an address bar on both bombs, <laughs> and it's like whoa, that's not the original thing that I thought it was. I, lo I do love the Snoopy and uh, Charlie Brown one is so great because that really is like something we would do to make fun of. Like, why are they in that? Yeah, yeah like, that's what? also very boomer. I think yeah. we have context for Garfield. Snoopy is almost that's a bit very like, yeah. Yeah, it's very hokey in every sense. I much prefer this new art, like the one we saw yesterday that makes me feel like I'm in the crying of Lot 49. <laughs> I prefer that. I've started looking for fucking, uh, for post horns all over the place now. I think it's fine if we become cute people. It's really, <laughs> like... Everything is sort of a sham. Nothing will ever be done. Uh, we're just sort of stuck in this struggle forever until, uh, you know, some epic scientist invents a way to solve global warming, but in a way that kills most of the Earth's population. <laughs> well, that's how you solve it. Yeah. Okay. Well, I guess I'm the epic <laughs> scientist. The other, yeah. uh, uh, but, um, you know, I think it's cool. I think Q is cool. It's epic like Pickle Rick, a yeah. mega death uh, experience. Yeah. Um, and I just got to say, I'm LGBTQ and on <laughs> human sacrifice this way. <laughs> Born into a child zoo this way. <laughs> I, I rather than becoming a Q and on person, I want to become like uh, a John Kerry type of person or the type of person who says uh, Coke of Cola <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Wendell's hamburgers. Yeah. Uh, no, Felix. Oh, you, we you, got a bad. We got a really. We, bad uh, one. You, you missed. You missed this. But on uh, on Thursday, uh, when Matt Burleson and I did the. Uh, fundraiser for uh, Julia Salazar. Uh, we were coming up with some pretty good um, John kerry is yeah. imagining uh, John Kerry talking about video games. Yeah, and playing Fortified Evening. Yeah. And, <laughs> and uh, who, you know, who wouldn't enjoy um, staying in uh, playing a game of the Super Martin Brothers? <laughs> uh, uh, let us go. <laughs> I think mine was when uh, we were uh, talking about going to the movies and I'm like, let's get there early for snacks. Uh, I would like a raisin to et. Oh, what, what would John Kerry call goobers? Buffoonish fellows. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we, there's a really bad one that's been infecting my brain. I mean, I'm never. I went to Chicago, and it just like it just you like got that I got, Midwest brain poison. Oh my god! Yeah. Well, Branson was saying Dave's double whooper, <laughs> 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 and that's just never coming back from that well, one. Well, no, you mentioned. Uh, of Smash Brothers is political, and that, that was what kicked it off, was uh, imagining John Kerry play, uh, playing the, who, who amongst us didn't like the, the Smashed Brothers. <laughs> <laughs> fraternally smashed. He calls Counter-Strike uh, counter Entente. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, I want to talk a bit about um, something, the place we're all going to be going. The going grave? very soon. No, even better. It's, it's like the grave, but infinite. I'm talking space. Oh yeah, I'm talking the about abyss. Oh yeah, I'm talking about the space force, which is um, yes. mm -hmm. something uh, you know. 
people uh we like to make fun of it now because it's another one of our presidents um buffoonish idiot dying like, brain just, yeah, fantasies like, <laughs> things things that he does and says to just sort of you know keep the plot line moving forward but i get the feeling the writers are a little bit tired at yeah. this point in the the run of the tv show so now we gotta this you know this this did remind me of like during the height of the Iraq war and the insurgency where during the state of the union, Bush said that we're going to go to Mars. Yes. Yeah. I think just space is like the, the final frontier because it gives perpetually, um, ailing presidencies, like a new big program to think about or do. Oh, yeah. hold on. Hold up. Stop the episode. Uh, we have to rename this episode, uh, in space. No one can hear you lie. Oh <laughs> yeah. They, they love space because it's big and cool. And, it's not cool though. It's so cool. I mean, you can find an alien out there. You can have sex no, with it. You're not. It's got it's got green skin and multiple t- like it's rows empty. of titties. It's a dentist's waiting room. No, nah, it's, it's terrible. Cool. Uh, but here's the thing. Okay, you say that. You say space is boring and lame. Maybe. Maybe it's a big empty abyss of absolutely nothing. And the idea of having peace there is absurd because you can't have anything other than peace there because there is nothing there. But what if you put cool guns in space? Because that's the premise of Space Force is NASA is boring, lame bullshit because they're a bunch of nerds who go up there with pocket protectors instead of AR-15s. That's it. They want to just strap some bazookas to the International Space Station and make it cool to go into space. Well, and I say, hell yeah. Well, space is the final frontier of like, honestly, dude, I wish somebody would fuck with me. Yeah. Because <laughs> like, there's I no mean, one like, there. Yeah, it's obvious what this is. Like, It's obviously just like an even bigger giveaway for the defense industry. Yeah. But it's also, I think there's a part of the brain. I mean, Reagan started this where it's like, honestly, dude, I fucking hate the Soviet union. That's like my worst enemy. But if somebody like came and fucked with planet earth, <laughs> yeah, dude, I would absolutely kick ass with them. Fuck around fucking respect to them. I would fuck around and I would find out. <laughs> it, it is like space force is, take away the part that's the defense industry giveaway which is yeah 90 percent of it it is 10 percent the core of the american psyche which is going somewhere where nothing will happen and going like you are so fucking lucky that there is nothing to threaten me here because i'm fucking ready <laughs> it's alien straw men yeah but what if like there is a space like if we live through halo but donald trump is president that's the greatest outcome and that's probably the most likely outcome. That's like the direction mm-hmm. everything's going in. Can we can we edit in some like Halo music yeah. into the background? Like, oh yeah, oh yeah. Imagine like there's like a platoon of Spartans in their induction ceremony and their power armor. They're all like seven feet tall because they're genetically augmented, and they're like, most of us will not return from this mission. It's our duty to the UNSC. And then Donald Trump just fucking stumbles out, and he's like, "Me and Larry Silverstein on a boat. Let me tell you a story." Ladies and gentlemen, the USS Baron Trump Gundam has exploded on the launch pad. <laughs> yeah. Master Chief, like, flying into the Covenant dropship with a nuke. And instead of, you know, the famous ending of Halo 2. We're, we're, that we're, famous ending. It is a famous, oh, yeah. it is a yeah, famous ending to people who actually consume culture. Thank you. Uh, it's when he defeats all the gorillas, right? He doesn't defeat all the gorillas. And they're not gorillas. <laughs> okay. They're called brutes. But uh, in the human parlance. But, you know, instead of, like, the commander asked Chief, uh, what do you think you're doing, Chief? And Chief, in his iconic, one of his few spoken lines, goes, sir, finishing this fight. But, you know, but he's never like... even going to get to that because Trump's going to be the commander and he's going to be, like, just talking about Judge, Judge Justine. Justine this is Perot. our best chance, though, at a, at a Luke Besson sci-fi where there's a bunch of, like, Rococo chandeliers and shit everywhere and, like, <laughs> Ryan Seacrest runs everything. I mean, that is also one of the most interesting, like, sci-fi interpretations. So, like, whatever. It could be worse. It could be better than fucking Star Wars. Uh, Baron, Melania, multipass. I do like the idea multi-pass. that, the, the, you know, the high school graduates who, who join the military to get a communications degree or something are going to be shot into outer space, a place that only people with like multiple, you know, like scientists. That's who, it, that's who NASA is. It's scientists. I, I can't underscore this enough about outer space. 
It could not be less hospitable to human. It's life. horrifyingly dangerous. <laughs> this is going to take raw recruits, and you're going to be like, "Good luck." Uh, it is true. Cold, though. It's going to be so yes. many people that just join the military for basic, like, "I'm going to learn how to run communication systems," and yeah, it's, it's like, going to be yeah, like, "Good luck, buddy." Ground control to Jerry Dunk. It's going to be. <laughs> it's it's going to be an amazing like adjustment. Yeah, Houston shit's incredibly fucking gay right now. <laughs> yeah, my internet's down. <laughs> the thing I like about it is the is the hooting is a love of it by the swine fans of sure. Trump. They love this shit. They don't even know what it means. They just hear the word force and that gets them excited. They love power. They love they love authority. They love the idea of Trump asserting authority. And I want to shout out a, sh- a show that we've uh, ragged on a lot, The Daily Show, uh, because they had an interview with a Trump supporter at a rally where they were talking about Space Force and it was, you know, let's laugh at the Rubes stuff, classic Daily Show. But I thought that this exchange from it actually was very illustrative of the way that they are thinking about Trump in general. So they asked this lady with a Trump hat on, hey, what about Space Force? And she says, Space Force is about exploration and finding out what's out there. <laughs> and he, and the, the Daily Show guy replies, NASA does space exploration. And this is her response. NASA is only going to tell us what they want us to know, whereas I think Trump will send his own stuff and we will find out the truth. Dude, yeah, he's going to say About his, what? I, I just, uh, his flat own, earth, alien species that we've been kept from, something like that. Yeah. I, I love, yeah, 2001 A Space Odyssey, but it's like the protagonist is Michael Flynn Jr. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing about. Well, the, they're like, uh, like, like 2001 Space Odyssey, Michael Flynn Jr. is also turning into a baby in front of your <laughs> eyes. Yeah. But, but the thing about it is, is that this shows how they're reconciling their inveterate hatred of government, right? They hate the government, they hate every element of the government, big government bureaucracy, they hate it. But they also are becoming, they're yearning for that fascist ruler, right? Mm-hmm. They love Trump, and, and they love the idea of him having total power. They think he deserves it because, we need to stress, they watched him on TV a lot, and they like him because of that. And they think, yes, this guy should have total control over everything. And the, only, the way you can square that is that he should basically create a shadow version of every element of government that is accountable only to him. They basically want to recreate the Sun King, only have it be Donald Trump. Like, like, yeah, it's like NASA's keeping all the good space shit from us. <laughs> space Force, they're going to let us know because it's not controlled by some nerd bureaucrats. It's controlled by Trump, who likes me personally, who's my friend, because I see him on the TV and he tells me how wonderful I am. Well, it's, but it's, it's, also, it's, it's also about, like, <clears throat> you know, like the, their, their hatred of government, but they're can, like they, they hate the deep state and the, and the government. And it's all become totally paranoid. But at the same time, <clears throat> they love the military. And it's yeah. the space force. If you part turn of it. NASA into the like, army, if NASA then it's good. Is militarized or like the generals are in charge of it? Then I trust that that's good. Uh, their intentions yeah. are good for the space force because right. it's it's the troops. Yeah, it's, it's that's that the old, there's that old yeah. joke about how if you wanted have new, uh, socialized health care, just turn it into the military. Give every gu- uh, doctor a gun, and everyone would be fine with it. I yeah um I can't wait for like the new version of Three Doors Down Kryptonite that's for people who lost bone density <laughs> <laughs> and had their insides cooked by solar radiation yeah. Uh, yeah. but but I mean I just wanted to go to Devry <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna be like the people now that are really into like Scarface and don't realize that Tony Soprano is bad but like there's gonna be or a the Verhovian, hero Scarface. there's gonna be like a Verhovian kind of like uh yeah, man, Starship Troopers is my favorite. I love those guys. It's so cool. It's like it's kind of my hero. Like it's oh, gonna God, be yeah. or, Johnny Johnny Rico, baby. Or it's gonna be you know, the I think the more high end version of the guy is the guy who reads Dune and is like, Man, Paul rocks. <laughs> this is a bunch of books about a cool guy who does the right thing. There's gonna but be a lot of misspelled tattoos of Paul Atreides. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I I need to get Michael Michael on the misspellings of Paul Atreides. That we're gonna, but uh, well, I mean, now that we're talking about you, now I'm just imagining Donald Trump nude, floating in a giant tank. No, Donald, Tr- <laughs> uh, beautiful. Uh, c- could you get the witch out of here? I don't want to talk in yeah. front no, of her. No, he's the fetus in the monolith. No, 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 no. Trump is Duke Leto and Baron. B- Baron's, Baron's the most Paul perfect Atreides. Paul I've ever seen. Yeah, yeah. Baron like, yeah, is yeah. clearly no, Paul but, but Melania, Melania coming she's, in. She is. She's yeah. a Benny Gesserit witch, obviously. Yeah, she brings in like a computer that plays Roblox, but on a high DPI. And she's like, no woman born child has ever played this much. <laughs> it is perfect that like uh, Frank Herbert came up with Teacot names. <laughs> That's oh, true. Duncan Idaho is perfect. Yeah. yeah. yeah um, so 
we've been uh, we've been making fun of the Space Force idea, but I have a little uh, selection for you here now that's making the case that maybe maybe this isn't so silly. Uh, this comes courtesy of Matt Lewis of the Daily News, who writes, uh, this is under the, uh, the sort of like the vertical is just called, why not? And the uh, headline I support, is... I support that being a vertical. <laughs> yeah. the, the, the case for a space force, thinking big. <laughs> there are plenty of good reasons to distrust this president and his latest vague idea, but there are even more good reasons not to dismiss the idea out of hand. Matt Lewis writes, uh, the idea was ripe for mockery. On Thursday, Vice President Mike Pence said that Don- President Donald Trump is hoping to establish a space force by 2020. That is a really short window of time yeah, to not literally happen. create a space armed force. Who, yeah. who is this person? Who Matt wrote Lewis this? of the Daily Beast. Okay. What's yeah. he? I wonder what he what he thinks about uh, socialized medicine. I wonder oh, impossible. If he thinks that's impossibly impossible. expensive. Yeah. yeah. Uh, some criticism. Some of the criticisms are thoughtful. Even if we indulge the idea that warfare of the future will require a space presence, it is debatable that we would need a six branch of the armed forces. Like, I don't think there's going to be, like, what they're thinking, I don't think there's going to be battles in space in the future. That's absolutely Over what Trump's thinks. Yeah, that, I guarantee 100% that's what Trump Over thinks. Over what? The moon. Uh, yeah, moon resources. The moon is trash, okay? I mean, I think I think it's more likely that Donald Trump has, like, a decades-old grudge with the moon. <laughs> so this and he's is like, my you issue. never thought I'd be in this position, huh? <laughs> this is my issue with, like, the kind of, like, conservative pundits that it's like, oh, you want... You want everyone to get a trophy and you want everyone to, and it's like, no, no, no. I am a very harsh Soviet style socialist and I believe I'm straight up tiger mom. When you have a dumb idea, it's a dumb idea and people should tell you that. And they have a double standard for it. And that is my problem with them is that they want to tell Donald Trump, but like, well, maybe it is a good idea. You know, maybe that is like, no, that is a stupid idea. You should feel bad. Go practice the piano. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I honestly, what they what they would like to do? These are like the uh, the mobile, like the the satellite nuclear weapons platforms, yeah, or like satellites that can drop like tungsten, the tungsten rods rod orbit yes, and like exactly. annihilate a city. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what like they're featured really in the go. second GI Joe movie. <laughs> GI Joe it's gonna retaliation. Be, there was a second GI Joe. GI Joe retaliation had it's the rock in it. It wasn't bad. It is going to rock when, like, the Saudis have, like, three orbital nukes and a rail gun and shit, and they still can't win Yemen. <laughs> I, like, can't wait. I can't wait till it's, like, absolute, like, we have to. Guys, we have to give them the orbital platform. This is when the just getting, Kodos like, prediction just, just, was the just best one. Fucking Houthis are just throwing sandals at it and destroying it. I can't wait for that. This uh, is the Kang and Kodos was the best one. They figured it out very early on. We knew this in the 90s. One day they will build a board with a board with a nail, and it's so big it will destroy them all. So uh, Matt Lewis, uh, he says, most commenters were quick to dismiss the idea. I can't understand why, uh, but he goes, I'm not necessarily championing the idea, but I think we should not automatically dismiss it either. America fought in the air for decades before creating a separate air force in 1947. Which was a mistake, by the way. They never should have created the Yeah, and we spent all that time fighting in space, and we don't have a space for us. <laughs> the Department of Homeland Security was created to coordinate homeland terrible, security terrible idea. He's, he's listing the perfect kind of bureaucratic bloat See, and overreach yeah. that the conservatives yeah. are supposed to be worried about. And again... Neither of those things should have existed. Encouraging the ambitions of idiocy. Yeah, like what is what's the Air Force's big project been the last ten years? The F thirty five, fucking trillion dollar plane that can't fly in a rain. Yeah, that's another uh, the F thirty. And it will kill <laughs> one fourth of the guys who try to eject from it. We created kill them. We Critical created a the sentient F-35. helicopter that can say nothing but please kill me. <laughs> 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 fucking yeah, we, Osprey, which has killed more U.S. fucking military personnel I than want explosive to die. force pre- penetrator. <laughs> yeah. No, that's amazing. We've created Habsburg military hardware. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! Uh. Just begging for death. <laughs> yeah. Uh. yeah, the F thirty five is just a pilot guillotine. <laughs> <laughs> Critical support for the most third worldist military yeah. equipment. It is yeah. deeply. I mean, a trillion dollars of the military budget to go to a, a troop murderer. Suicide. Uh, no, like the, the F thirty five, it functions like the the pilot ejects functions. It works. You're in the cockpit. 
but it, in the front of the cockpit is a giant cannon pointed at your head. <laughs> And that's what blows the canopy yep, off. Yep. But you have to like you when you pull sure it, you, you have duck. to make sure you You've duck. Got a duck. <laughs> you gotta duck when that cannon goes off. The cannon actually fires ten thousand razor blades <laughs> projected outward at subsonic speeds. Yeah, Be- because of lowering lowering requirements to become a pilot, the Air Force is now accepting people with DUIs. <laughs> but the F thirty five the F thirty five has a sobriety test thing where you blow it. <laughs> but it's <laughs> also because of a pre existing contract with Smith and Wesson. It's also a revolver with. <laughs> One bullet in the chamber. We can't take the bullet out. Look, there's only a one six chance that you'll die. I mean, honestly, like it's not even a fatal shot to the head if you yeah. shoot yourself in the mouth. So yeah, you're just fine. do it. You have to pull the trigger to blow Freud, it. But death drive has never been more like provable. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. No. By the way, the F thirty five is another uh, pithy answer to the question why we can't yeah. have universal health right. care. Yeah. Um, so uh, just a little bit more. He goes, um, "Why is this such a crazy idea?" According to the Heritage Foundation's James, oh, oh, oh yeah. if you say so. According to the Heritage Foundation's James J. Uh, Carafano, a foreign policy and national security expert, there's no reason why the Air Force would oversee this domain. The Air Force doing space is like the difference between selling a car and washing a car. Different activities. If you go high enough, and if you level high enough as a wonk, you just go back to being what you were as a wonk child, which is like, well, Superman obviously could not <laughs> yeah, be Aquaman in his home of the ocean. Yeah, that's exactly what it's ridiculous. Like. All of these conservatives, they're always, every time they bitch about any kind of youth culture or kind of like liberal mercy or forgiveness or none of, I don't like those things either, by the way. I'm a very <laughs> harsh person. We've established this. But like then they're like, well, what if the complete fucking idiot it actually isn't a complete fucking idiot? Maybe you should be a little easier on this absolutely confident moron. But I'm still trying to get my head around which activity is he comparing to going into space, the most dangerous and most horrifying and most technologically complicated activity humans have ever endeavored. Washing a car or selling one? Something that Wait, which requires... one of those two things is he comparing to going to fucking outer space? Something that required first and foremost a Soviet Union. And yes, like America sent people to the moon, but let's be honest, we wouldn't have given a shit no. if the Soviet Union were doing it first. Not at all. They kept us honest. No. Yeah. This whole space race was supposed to go to Sputnik. Uh, I mean, well, no, is, is, there, is there any greater like participation trophy than what conservatives like give the military? <laughs> She's like, when was the last time we won one? <laughs> <laughs> like the exactly. fucking first Gulf War? What the fuck? Yeah, and it's just like, cars, no, yeah. we have to give them space. That will give. It's like just Tony buying AJ his drums. <laughs> if he has a reward, he'll be encouraged. <laughs> it's like, show me the W's on the board. <laughs> show me your report card. Doesn't look good. <laughs> yeah, it's like public public school teachers. They they want to fire public school teachers for underperforming with their test scores. Yeah. How the hell is there not some sort of discipline for these military? No, they're guys still operating on some Montessori hippie bullshit up. where you get a giraffe in spelling. <laughs> <laughs> it's like I wouldn't say we failed Afghanistan, but we turned it into a bigger project. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, listen to this. Um, he goes, Trump, Matt Lewis writes, Trump aside, though, I think the cavalier dismissal of this idea speaks to a diminished ambition to do big things. The first Im- How about everybody on Earth not die? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. How about everyone imag- on the planet Earth not be cooked to death? Well, I get again. Or, like, you know what? That's how a about, pretty big project. How about even small things like socialized healthcare? Something exists in third world countries. I love this. Like, while the tides are literally rising to kill everybody, this is like, you know, me, me and my wife, we fight every single day. We both throw. We both throw. Uh, ironing boards at each other. We fucking hate each other. We call we call the cops on each other every day. I think if I have a kid, I can save this marriage. <laughs> <laughs> that's what, like going into spaces. Yeah, for us. Like, yeah, yeah. yeah no. it's no, but it's very. But what if we bought a boat? <laughs> <laughs> no, he goes. Uh, he goes. The first and most obvious analogy is to Ronald Reagan's much derided strategic defense initiative. Yeah, Timber. because it was stupid. Listen to this. When you're gonna work. stop giving these people fucking gold stars for trying. Listen, it never was worked. stupid. Listen never to this, worked. Amber. Lampooned as Star Wars. The idea it was a lampoon. That's what they called it. The idea of a defense shield used to shoot down Soviet missiles contributed to the bankrupting of the Soviet Union. Not really. Yeah, no, what it did, but that's ex- only what it did. But none of these missile defense systems work. No. The, they, they still don't know how to shoot a nuclear missile nope. out of the sky. It's no. all 
hokum. Yeah. It's, it's bullshit. It's, not, it's, it's just like they're spending money it's, on these it. guys selling, going door to door selling lightning rods. Yeah. Well, well, the, the biggest legacy to any type of missile, miss, uh, missile defense started in the 80s is that it became like the Cutco knives for every large <laughs> yeah. nation. It's like all uh, we and Russia do is just go around the world selling missile defense systems to countries that hate the shit out of each other and be like, it will never fail ever, dude. You're fucking set. Because we, it's like the two countries with two like the most advanced air forces selling missile defense systems to everyone it's brilliant yeah it's fucking brilliant like I, I have to give special props to russia for selling missile defense systems to both syria and saudi arabia selling them to azerbaijan and armenia they're amazing Camps. they're amazing they learned from watching us man they learned from iran that. iraq war baby they got yeah. the good leads yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah. Got the Glen Gary leads, and yeah, and it's just like no one really knows how much these things work, if at all. But it just like God, do we love selling them, and do places but love also, buying them? It, Star Wars, by the way, was not some like smear. That's what conservatives called it. Everyone called it. They were starry eyed idiots. Yeah. They were just like we're gonna blast. No, everyone, we're, we're gonna it. form a grid over the entire country. And again, still doesn't work. Never they worked. have no fucking no, idea how to idiotic. do this. It's idiotic. It's, it's stupid. To, it's to give people like uh, some sense of security. They're like, oh, well, if someone shot a nuclear missile at us, I think we could uh, just pew, 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 shoot fine. it out of Yay. the sky. Like, you know, no, sorry. Um, just closing out here, he says, uh, speaking of costs, an obvious criticism of Trump's initiative has to do with money. Small government conservatives might not be keen on creating a new federal bureaucracy with more overhead. I bet yeah, they okay never have. I bet they'll be fine yeah, with it. Yeah. I have a feeling. And big, defense, big, defense contracts? And guns big, in space? Sign me up. Remember and, how they stopped DHS from being formed? Yeah. It's just going to end up, though, like a Muskian thing where they just literally put a bunch of loose guns in a rocket and blast it. <laughs> so that if you're up there, you can reach out the window yeah. and grab one. Gonna... <laughs> <laughs> he goes, uh, and it's going to be city bikes for guns. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be the Michael Jackson scream video. That's what they want to happen. And big government liberals might prefer us to see the money spent on nation building at home. For example, the Mission Democrats are asking... How is there no money to fix the water crisis in Michigan, but we can afford to fund this Trump's space force? That's an idea. Well, you yeah, can that's substitute an any crisis and ask why we would fund a space force and not insert problems because for which it's there cool. isn't funding. Christ, <laughs> yeah, you could bring up. How a can crisis. someone support the space force but not support, say, higher teacher pay or universal health care? I would argue not that cooking the, to death. I not would, everyone I, on earth dying. I would argue that the Space Force fits into the existing national security rubric. If health insurance is a universal <laughs> right, what? one could argue what? that no other expenditure is appropriate or legitimate. Well, what certainly if there's not clean yeah. water in space. Like I mean, I, I would actually argue just that reaching yeah. for anything. Uh, spending money on the Space Force is not appropriate or legitimate no, at all because not. it's no. a, a nonsense. But he's problem. saying he's saying because it's in because we already have a military. It's just more military. So he just it's okay. says price tag aside. I think we are responsible. <laughs> for our own diminished attitude towards progress. There was a I time... I agree. It, yeah. Which is why we're going to kill you and take all your money. There was a time when we believed in exploration and That's dreamed a, of a brighter we future. Yeah, what do you we were competing for? with the yeah. Soviet Union. The guns An are being actually ambitious down. nation project. If we do fucking orbiting space platforms with guns on them, they're not going to be pointed up. <laughs> they're going to be pointed down at Earth. It has nothing to do with exploring anything. Yeah, well, his NASA, I mean, even Amber, as you said, even though it was a uh, ludicrous project of Cold War dick measuring, uh, NASA actually did kind of represent the hope of a brighter future. Absolutely. And, and space as a kind of shared project for humanity which i you know and the thing is it was a cold war relic the reason nasa died at, is after because the cold war ended yep because we the didn't fucking have to russians, we had no one to keep us honest the russians were the ones who just sent a thing into space no reason to do it no clear economic gain just progress and then we never would have occurred to us in the capitalist west to do that we did it to show them we could and to compete with them on the as a propaganda effort that was the only reason we did all that exploration stuff. If you just go by the gritty, brutal uh, ledger logic of capitalism, there's never there's no a good reason, reason to go yeah. into space ever. Yeah. You have to have the have ambitions have, and yes. the and the the concepts the that are of communism. divorced. Yes, that are divorced from capital. You have to be able to, to the idea of human flourishing being its own fucking 
uh, goal instead of profit. You gotta have Star Wars dreams. <laughs> But you just like the I, the thing he said about the water. Like, can you walk me through how like the space military? Like, imagine through some. He's just imagine for through anything. like some miracle we find like an asteroid that has like naturally occurring water on it. Can you just a just the idea of like we're out of clean water, but we're gonna go into space and uh, bring it back down through uh, the atmosphere? I feel like many many asteroids are in fact made of ice to be. Oh no with. no I know I know, but it's like extracting the water from space yeah. to Earth, and then you put like. Because it would eventually be like after about five years of space for us, it'll be like, you know, honestly, we need contractors for this. We need private <laughs> industry. And it'll be the Eric. Eric Prince is going to be the emperor from Warhammer. <laughs> He's going to be mostly made out of like the Oakleys that have the, headphones. Well, in I don't them. They're going to they're gonna find an asteroid in the asteroid belt uh, between Mars and uh, Saturn or Jupiter. Anyway, they're going to find an ice asteroid the size of Texas and uh, Blackwater is going to crash it into Michigan. Yeah, yeah. Like, you are welcome, sir. <laughs> yeah, uh, that it, is how they solve global warming on Futurama. Basically, they take yeah, a big the big chunk ice of, cube. That's what I was gonna say. They the take big a big chunk cube. of uh, comet ice and dump it in the ocean. Yeah, just I I can't wait till yeah no we're gonna use the only like ex the the only expansion of government we've had for the last like thirty years, which is law enforcement and the military to solve global warming. And like Matt's talked about this, that's so just gonna be like border enforcement and stuff. But it literally will also just be like fucking idiots with tribal tattoos like shooting icebergs <laughs> shooting waves yeah you have you have 30 seconds to not hit our coast sir <laughs> just emptying a fucking xm8 into it but again like overall i am really impressed by matt lewis's piece here that he finds a way to um polish this absolute turd idea of the space force and justifies it by being like hey that's his boy you know it's his little boy we're We've just gotten too cynical. Can't we dream big of a better yeah, future? Yeah, get rid of capitalism and, and, can and talk. again, the idea he's literally talking about is just putting guns in space. Yeah. Like mm -hmm. that's if you really want to talk about exploration for its own sake, get rid of capitalism and we can talk. As long as capitalism yeah. is the guiding logic and ideology of all interactions in human existence, we will not have exploration for its own sake. No, the only reason America did that was because we were trying to compete with a superior state project. Yep. Mm-hmm. Correct. Well, you, you mentioned this, but this is uh, moves on to my uh, second reading selection for today, which is about the danger, the danger inherent in doing anything other than uh, capitalist democracy. This comes courtesy of uh, Connor Friedersdorf, oh, writing in The Atlantic. Everyone's favorite <coughs> Billy quiz boy. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I, I didn't get it. We, uh, Matt Birds and I, we're gonna, we were going to do this at the Salazar fundraiser, but we didn't get the, uh, the time to. But I'm glad I can do it for you here now because this is a doozy courtesy of Connor. Uh, this is in The Atlantic, and the headline is Democratic Socialism Threatens Minorities. <laughs> I, I don't like that I know who this guy is. I just like it's like I, Connor Friesdor, he's like just one of those guys where it's like the only context I know him in is like, oh, he's one of the guys who's bad at writing articles. And, but I feel like I've seen his name 5,000 times this year. It's it, it's it's the most it, mathematically mean, white name I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> just in general, though, like our modern media landscape, it is just pro wrestling, but even worse. It's like you have you have the heel, but the heel is never like entertaining. He never stands up to the crowd and goes like, ah, oh, fuck you. Unless he's Kevin Williamson, who's like one of the only good heels in the business because he looks at like the. He does literally the pro wrestling thing of like, uh, you fucking ruse. Why don't you go to move to a city where there are jobs? <laughs> but they're mostly just guys like this, just sort of like squirmy guys who write like half-baked articles that are sort of pounced on the moment they're written. And then you have you have the sort of face heels like David Frum. And it just like, I can't wait till this is automated. I do not like knowing the faces to the names here. I have to know who all these guys are. Awful. Connor writes, uh, this is the, the subhead, <clears throat> nothing better protects victims of bigotry than a system where they can pursue their needs and wants outside the realm of popular control. Hmm. Now, to like, I'm not going to read all of it, but like Connor, he, he, he tees it up by referencing uh, two recent articles in Jacobin magazine that attempt to uh, explain or define what, so, what socialism means like beyond just like, a better welfare state or more social spending. And they define it as democratic control of the economy, basically. 
Um, and Connor is very frightened by that. And this is how he interprets that message. I'm skipping to about the middle of the article, but he goes... Sorry, I feel like I actually did have to look up his face after you mentioned that, because I realize I don't know what he looks like. Oh, he looks like you would expect him to. Uh, my looks- man got no lips. Yeah, he looks like you would expect him to. He looks like a Playmobil man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was going to say that I- I've never seen him, but I just imagine that he looks like one of those shiny uh, cartoon boys on the side of like a margarine box from the <laughs> 1950s, something like that. Would that be wrong? I'm just, I'm just so He's sick of... He's a little of, boy on the tube of callous caviar. I'm Sweden. just so sick of these guys specifically, the guys who are like, well, I'm a classical liberal. <laughs> it's like, I honestly... It's just so boring. Like, no one gives a shit about these No, and no one believes and, it. There, you know, there's no it's not a real thing. in the real belief. No Americans agree with this shit. Being a classical liberal is like, it, it's like speaking fucking Esperanto. Cling, cling on, yeah. actually, because it's like, yeah, you can technically do it, but like, <laughs> okay, okay, yeah. It, it's, you know, they should just replace all like, you know, concern trolling, like, like, Right wing under a veil, right? Just give me Trump supporters. Honestly. I think well, these they are people, who, they, they speak these are people, people who think we would solve a lot of problems by switching to the metric system. <laughs> mm-hmm. I mean, that's the thing. It's like this, these are so it's so enervating just because it's such a huge percentage of the media uh, dialogue is conducted by these people, and they speak for no one. They have no popular constituency on earth. As risible and awful as it would be to listen any, to. Yeah howling trump supporters in these things at least you know that you're getting a reflection of an actual political tendency with influence and power in this country and you can that can make you figure out like what the terms of the debate are these guys are in cloud cuckoo land let's see how uh, connor attempts to address the growing populism of uh, socialism in america and how he's going to try to convince us that this is all actually very dangerous and the thing that we think we want uh, we actually don't because we haven't thought about it enough the way he has He writes, instead of individual capitalists deciding what to produce in their endlessly varied, constantly competing private businesses, quote, without any democratic input from the rest of society, control over industry and decisions about what to produce would reside in state planning agencies and imagine their decisions and, and imagine their decisions perfectly, if improbably reflect the actual democratic will of workers, whether in a nation or a state like Ohio or Utah or a metropolitan area like Maricopa County or Oklahoma City. Popular control is finally realized. So, how popular is Islam? How many Muslim prayer rugs would the Democratic majority of workers vote to produce? How many Korans? How many headscarves? How much halal meat would be slaughtered? What share of construction materials would a majority of workers appropriate to new mosques? Oh, oh, I thought this was political science. I'm in racist remedial math. You're giving me a word problem. (laughs) Under capitalism... The mere existence of buyers reliably gives rise to suppliers. Relying instead on democratic decisions would pose a big risk for Muslims and Sikhs and Hindus and Jews and maybe even Catholics. We would be at the whim of a mass of, I guess, hooting chud socialists who would demand that they only make like a replica Dale Earnhardt of Intimidator. I think uh, because uh, in his his world, uh, like, you know, a mass of working class people is just as reactionary as he is deep down when he sits at home at night and says racial slurs, whispering them into a teacup to feel better. Yeah. You know, that's just such a weird, like anti anti anti-Semitism. Like, you know, look, yeah, the Jews control money in the media, but they need it, or else the <laughs> masses, yeah. the socialist masses, would kill them. Dude. Well, it's I, like I their version of a gun. This is, uh, you know, I think what what Connor's doing here is uh, is sort of clever in that he is taking, uh, presumably, his liberal audience's uh, fear of the the you know the the masses and their ignorant, stupid beliefs, and transporting it to being like, well, socialism means that. All of those, um, you know, all the dumb people who with bad beliefs that you don't agree with would now have control over how many, you know, they, they would, yeah, they, they the would world, be in charge of the he, mosque he's planning saying, Look, commission. The world is stupid and mean, unlike, you know, the people who read my columns. Um, they're definitely more dangerous to you than I am. And that's what these people have always said to like a kind of uh, class of like, say, antisocial liberal reformers that are fundamentally contemptuous of the working class. Yeah. And, right. uh, and like, uh, like, like these things are bound, bound to their identities and not, and not manifestations and I, of capitalism. And itself. I also like, you know, I mean, he's using the, the fear of like a centrally planned economy to be like, 
democratic control of that state planning would it, you, it would but be really it, would be, it also would hinges be, on the fact that that a capitalist economy has in fact been kind and noble to minorities exactly i mean this is the thing that he's like under a centrally planned economy it would be really hard to build a mosque in a local municipality unlike it is now right which is just which like is you know yeah. to, they're they're doing mosque you know ribbon cutting ceremonies every week in this country because that's what the free market <laughs> demands and he goes this gets even better he goes right now under capitalism vegetarians and vegans have more options every year but there aren't very many of them five percent of americans are vegetarians three percent are vegans would the workers find a societal need to produce vegan milk vegan meat or milk substitutes no one knows the answer how important would worker majorities consider hair products for African Americans? What if a majority of workers decided that only <laughs> English language commercial reading material should be printed in the United States? I don't know. It sounds to me like he's confused socialism and national socialism again. He's pulled that old goof. I, I think his understanding of the way uh, economies get planned, and they do get planned, whether they get planned by capitalists or whether they get planned democratically, economies are in fact planned. Mm -hmm. Um they're just planned poorly or not. Uh, and he, he just thinks that, you know, the majority of people are awful and he's a good person. And he wants to make sure that all the, every minority gets what they want. And actually working class people would exclude uh, people because, you know, they don't read Connors Friedersdorf. How do they know that it would be? I think he's also assuming that in a socialist society, every single decision would be just decided by a majority vote. And it's mm. like, hey, are we going to give rights to gay people? Show of hands, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's just like, well, there. I mean, obviously not every law is created that way. And that's not exactly what democratic input over crucial elements of how our society is run entails. So he's just... He's but like, also, we know very well that the larger the structure, the more socially liberal uh, laws it produces. Yeah, uh, yeah, Con Connor should ask. You know, if the Bolsheviks took over, what would, they, would, would what would they do about women's they rights? Yeah, they well, they legalized legalize abortion and women owning and property divorce, and getting divorced, and they decriminalized and, and guess homosexuality. What? I don't think the majority well, of Russians fair, they bounced would, around on that. You know, I wonder how they felt about right. that. And in there the was early a reaction 20th century. to it. Yeah, Stalin, Hala, but their initial response was to yes, liberalize all that shit. If contraception at every CVS and Walgreens sounds better than popular control, by the way, I'm from a state where. Uh, where they were allowed to say, I'm sorry, I don't prescribe mm -hmm. uh, birth control to yeah. unmarried women. So fuck off. He says, if, if con Amber, you say that, but if contraception in every CVS and Walgreens sounds better than popular control, you may be a laissez-faire capitalist, <laughs> or at least recognize why democratic socialism can be a nightmare for many sorts of people. Does he really think that birth control is that controversial? Look, Who's you he hanging what? around with? This, this Kevin actually, Williamson. Super, super this actually butts up against uh, butts up against something that a lot of kind of left leaning people believe too, which is that actually the community is the more liberal and merciful and forgiving unit. It's not okay. The community is reactionary. Community justice, by the way, is most commonly recognized in this country as lynchings. The bigger you go, the better the laws produce. You want to go big. Communities. It, community is a reactionary concept. And when the smaller uh, a unit that gets to decide something, the more ex exclusive it's going to be. And what Connor's doing here is that he's making it all about, um, again, like consumer products and like all of, of the course. Nice, all the nice things we get to buy and are marketed to and all the various groups that have their, their whims catered to because there's a market for well, it. Well, that's but, what freedom is for him. Yeah, but, but again, like when, when you're talking about democratic control of the economy what you're talking about is uh who gets all the fucking money produced by a society mm -hmm. which is sort of a bigger question than who gets to buy what products yeah yeah well if you want to talk about like sort of real consumer rights or whatever when you have a large block of people that aren't completely eliminated from the economy they have more political power and also, like, the birth control thing, like, is literally, like, I'm sorry, we're 52% of the population. Like, n no. no. I, I, Connor, I'd, yeah. I'd feel very confident if we put that just up to popular support, there would still be birth control. There would be more birth control available than there is now Certainly. under the ideal system that you yeah. seem to like so much. This is, this is, this is the real tell, though. He goes, uh, as Hayek put it, our freedom of choice in a competitive society rests on the fact that if one person refuses to satisfy our wishes, we can turn to another. 
But, he added, if we face the monopolist, we are at his absolute mercy. Socialists are attuned to the ways individuals are vulnerable in capitalism, but blind to the ways it frees us from the preferences of the majority. Nearly all of us would hate abiding by the will of the majority on some matters. Do you understand that, like, the majority of people don't give a shit what other people do because it doesn't affect them? People really overestimate how much of uh, kind of right-wing sentiments are, they come from above. They come from a, a, they come from an elite. Uh, Hayek, by the way, was a big fan of the Pinochet regime. So it's good to know that. That's what uh, I mean by the tell here. Yeah. It's just this idea that, like, no one, no one gives a shit. Like, literally, working class people, like, they don't give a shit. They turn to cultural conservatism because it's literally the only like political access they have. This is idiotic. Con- and Connor shit, is also never going to be a majority. The well, idea I- that it's just a, ba- a, a, a baying horde is, is yeah, it's the kind of stuff these guys st- tell each other to scare their fellow it's a urban liberal. Uh, uh, their, their fellow working bleeding class heart. conservatism is a consolation prize for having a miserable life. And I think the other thing, like Connor as a, the classical liberal, and he started out as sort of like a Ron Paul libertarian guy. And what he's doing in this whole article is uh, reversing what the usual libertarian take on democ- like you know, mass democracy is, which is that it's bad because it gives minorities too many rights. These are what like real libertarians think yes. about democracy. This oh God, is like yes. The the Hans Hermann Hoppe or yeah. Murray Rothbard or like the real. If you're a re- or Kevin, even Kevin Williamson, this is oh, like absolutely the, con- Kevin the standard Williamson. conservative thing about like we're a republic, not a democracy. Yeah, keep and, your like, shit. You're you know, going to take my stuff. Again, the problem with democracy in, in the traditional sense is, is precisely that it protects minorities too much. Yeah. And that if you give the, the masses too much say over a democracy, they will invariably give themselves too many yeah. rights and protections idea- from people like Connor Friedersdorf and the owners of the Atlantic. Yeah. But what he's doing in this article, and we should be very clear, is that he's flipping that around on its head and using it to uh, play on the sympathies and prejudices of a liberal readership who are worried about, you know, the dumb, ignorant the masses words. who are racist and backwards and, you know, uh, against uh, contraception and African-American hair products and vegan meats and meat substitutes and shit like that. Well, all I got to you say that. But what if one of these Democratic socialists decides to strap a mask on and go into Gotham City and declare to the people there that the city is theirs now? And then they get to take all the stuff, but he actually has a timed nuclear device in the back of a garbage truck that's driving around the city and is going to blow up and kill everybody, mm-hmm. no matter what happens. Well, you know, we all think we all think it's going to be cool when Bane takes over your city, but what if yeah. it's not? He's got a bomb, folks. Folks, what if it's not? Yeah. All right, uh, I'm going to move on to the, my last selection for today. I think uh, Felix, I think this will be a treat for you. This is sort of can't a, be written by someone who isn't an NPC. Like <laughs> unfortunately, not. Just it just like went right through me. <laughs> it was just like it's like gamma rays. It was like it was like eating. Was it was like pockets, somehow but... I drank a broth who that only had cholesterol in it. <laughs> I just feel sluggish and like, oh god, how is there? It's like if you want to be a free market guy, how is there a market for this guy? There isn't. No, there's no market yeah. for any of it. It's, it's just yeah, you know, fucking He doesn't boring. exist with a, in an organic economy. In yeah. a completely organic economy, I would eat him. Yeah. <laughs> that was a, oh, that reminds me of a hilarious thing he did of like a few years ago, uh, or maybe it was last year, talking about uh, socialism. He tweeted something along the lines of uh, 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 socialism. You you take the people's labor and you make it like common property like but i'm a writer what is that what are you gonna do with my my work Honey. <laughs> buddy don't worry about it. Down I, the I, fuck. I, love, I love the idea of like stalin being like we need more of those freeze door columns get to work like, the people demand it this is for the soviet union they love reading your takes about fucking god knows what people lo- people love the literary equivalent of sitting in lukewarm bath water and drinking a cup of milk mixed with flour <laughs> Okay, Felix, can, maybe this will jolt you. Give yeah, me I, think this, I honestly think this is going to be like the adrenaline needle from Pulp Fiction yeah. right okay, in his heart. Yeah. Okay. Opinion, New York Times. Let's go. Does Sasha Baron Cohen understand Israel? Uh, you always know what to get me. <laughs> <laughs> you always know what com- to get me. The comedian's new show makes a mockery of Israeli machismo, but he doesn't know who we really are. This is by Shmuel Rosner. This is what I've been waiting for, dude. This is my favorite. I'm going to guess what it is without having seen it, but okay, I'm going to go, go I'm, I'm guess what it is. 
and it's like the awesome new type of Zionism. And it's it's coming for everything, right? Like we've all agreed this is coming for everything, where it's no longer like the mid two thousand salva to Americans, which is like the oh we're the strong state. Like we need us to civilize this region. It's like it's gonna make it sort of like identitarian, but like this uh feel good Hollywood identitarianism where you're like You're pretty close. This is, you're pretty yeah, close. This is yeah. birthright magic. You're yeah. <laughs> You know, well, it's not just that, right though. Fashion. It's yeah. you think that we're like a uh, cool, done, gun toting, uh, macho dudes, but actually we're civilized cucks. Yeah, that that is exactly what this piece does. Um, I I'd just like to point out that um, Shmuel Rosner is the same guy who wrote an opinion take for the New York Times. I think his last one was during the latest Gaza massacres. The headline was "Israel is entitled to do." By is entitled to protect itself by any means necessary. Yep. So yep. That was his take on that. And he says, Sasha Baron Cohen just doesn't understand Israel. Uh, Sasha Baron Cohen speaks Hebrew fluently, and I think his parents live there. I think yeah. he has a pretty good idea. Yeah, but of, until, uh, until you've worn like capri pants every day of your life, <laughs> and like you, your day consists of waking up and getting to a shoving match at a restaurant called like Pizza Fiesta. <laughs> <laughs> you, you live the true life of an Israeli man. So uh, he, he writes here, I first met Colonel Iran Morad 25 years ago. Well, sort of. Murad is the fictional brainchild of Sasha Baron Cohen, the famous prankster and comedian who has been stirring controversy with his new show. Who the is genius. A, who is America. Yep. The Big Colonel, Dick Cohen. The Colonel. One of several of Mr. Cohen's new alter egos is an ultra macho ex Mossad agent who travels around the United States duping Israel loving conservatives into embarrassing themselves, for example, by pulling down their pants to fight terrorists. So, of course, I don't mind the re I didn't meet the real Murad, but I met a Murad or someone resembling him. My wife and I were young Israeli volunteers in a small North American Jewish community. One day, we got an invitation to a lecture by a retired Israeli military officer. He was in America trying to boost Israel's image, and his tools were his thick Israeli accent, his brash manner, and his captivatingly dry observations. You know, the retired lieutenant colonel told his crowd of mostly, mostly elderly Canadian Jews, we could throw all of the Arabs into Jordan, but the world won't let us. I assume he meant Jordan the country, not Jordan the river, but who knows? That's a funny joke. Oh, that's yeah. I love we could just, dry wit. Yeah, yeah. Uh, if you know this, but Palestinians don't feel pain. <laughs> the lieutenant colonel became part of my family's folklore to this day. We use his phrase as an absurd excuse for our simple failures. I truly tried to convince the pigeons to get off the balcony, I might say to my wife, but the world won't let us. Oh, man. That's I nice. would love to be a fly on the wall in that family. This sounds like a wacky place. Let me tell them, Tell me more about your family's inside jokes. Yeah. Could we uh, could, could we get this guy like a 24-episode commitment for a Bravo reality show to watch his awful family mm -hmm. make their hilarious jokes? We found so much humor in our Murad. And in case you wonder, yes, I do remember his real name. Because he seemed outdated even then, in the mid-1990s, like an effigy from the 50s, or maybe the 60s. Uh, he can't think of any earlier examples because Israel didn't exist. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, also, you don't want to talk about what they did in 48. <laughs> yeah. Little things you want to gloss over. He goes back in the 50s and 60s when There's Israel a hotel that got a very bad Yelp review. <laughs> <laughs> he says back in the 50s and 60s when Israel was still thought of as a land of camels and Uzis. Dude, they'd be lucky if that's what people thought of them now. <laughs> Um, but we weren't that country uh, anymore two decades ago, and we are certainly not that country no today. One, no <laughs> one helped us. We did it by ourselves. I love that. That's Blow my up, favorite. Baby. That's my favorite. Like little like Israeli PR trick when they're like, "Yeah, well, we used to have nothing, and now look, we like have like a Tiva's factory. We have a we invent apps that are just like shittier versions of Google Maps, and it's like." Yeah, you're like an incredibly well-funded imperial proxy. Yeah. It's so cool. It's like it's like if you like the people on the space like people just act like the space station was just like unaffiliated with the government or something. <laughs> like, yeah, just me and my friends put it together. <laughs> this thing that orbits around the world. But Earth. he can't awesome. decide like what is actually he's mad about. Because he's like, you think we're Uzis, but actually we're more like a Hello Kitty Beretta. What are, the, like, what are, what are they using to massacre all those decide people? Decide what's gate, offensive, offensive about the stereotype. 
Like, who are those guys doing all the shooting people and like laughing about it on video? Like, well, were those guys not like that guy? Well, he says today the military is not as dominant in Israel's culture uh, as, it yeah, used yeah, to yeah. Be, mm-hmm. as it used to be. And Israel is more westernized, more capitalist, more focused on trade and high tech innovation. We're not violent. We're capitalist. Yeah. Now. The, the idea that he's creating a dichotomy there. What the fuck? Do you guys remember when like they were like rolling out the PR campaign for Gal Gadot? Oh, yeah. And they just like that the, they're like, like the hot Israeli chick who held a gun thing was very much a part of the promotion of the movie. I'm just trying to under yeah it's, wait a minute. So the United States that's a capitalist country, right? Mm, yes, very. Not a very prominent military in our country. Not well, not a dominant institution in American life at all. Well, you know, n- not in our culture. Yeah, of you know? course yeah, not. Yeah. No. Yeah. Every other movie it's, isn't about some fucking <laughs> every other asshole. sporting event. Yeah. So he goes. Um, Maraud is a caricature of our past, mm. not our present. Oh, weird. And yet, we cannot escape the image. Again, this guy's last <laughs> column, I think, was about how literally just mowing down yes. uh, just unarmed Palestinian, Fine. unarmed Palestinian, just, just for no touching scoping, air holing like medics and yeah. children yeah. Uh, for, you know, as they approach a fence. Totally justifiable. Totally justifiable. And he's just like, for some reason, people have this image of us as some sort of Military obsessed, bloodthirsty. Oh my culture. god! I just realized something. Shmuel is reverse Ellie. He's like, no, we are diaspora boy now. Yes, yeah, yeah. 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 No, he's saying Murad is Israel man, but Israel man doesn't exist anymore. Yeah. We're all diaspora boys now. He goes, we cannot escape the suspicion that there are still some Murads in our midst. Brave commandos who become political leaders or arms dealers or pundits. Israelis who are blunt, macho, crude, boisterous, pompous, and trigger happy. Israelis who forget to shed their uniform mentality even when their services are no longer needed. What's the damage for us? Does it help Israel to have this blustering masculine image or does it hurt it? We still have dangerous enemies, so maybe keeping this stereotype going is useful. We seem tough, after all, with our big muscles and love of guns. What do you mean, we? Yeah. We, uh, yeah. On the other no hand, one would confuse you with them. On the other hand, the Murad caricature makes us look bellicose and pig-headed, if not downright absurd. And it probably makes us seem hideous to many Americans, especially young ones, especially liberal ones, the Americans with whom Israel already has an image problem. I wonder how that happened. This yeah. is ins- this is this just, just shows like- you how that the the cultural <laughs> insanity that has infected everyone, where representation is the only thing that matters, and and actual things that occur. This are is basically him trying to recoup Adam Friedland. That's what this article <laughs> is. Like they, you just massacred a ton a ton of people. And you're still bombing Gaza right now. In fact, there's re- there, there, there's reports saying that they're now just literally indiscriminately attacking civilians now, like even changing their uh, their like rules of engagement and stuff to be even less cognizant of civilian casualties than ever before. And that doesn't that's just a weird that's just a, a, a unfortunate byproduct of Italy, of uh, Israel doing the self defense that it's it's. Uh, it deserves as a sovereign nation. It, it, it's this guy going on TV that's giving people the bad fucking idea of what Israel is like. Well, there used to be, uh, but back before we had a totally collapsed media world where everyone's sort of in the same pool of uh, just open mouth shitheads lapping up the same pool, like muddy water. The two tiered like Hasbara system used to be kind of like, you know, this is during the Bush years, it would be, you know, towards uh, conservatives, it would be like, we're the only civilizing force. You know, we are, we're going to keep this place in line. We were the best bad neighborhood. Yeah. yeah. But then there is a specific one that I was think of, and it was on the Joe Rogan podcast. He was talking about his Israeli friend and he's like, yeah, I have this Israeli friend. He's so great. We just go to his house and they play drums all the time and dance, which like yeah. sounds funny fucking awful <laughs> but he's like yeah and i was like why what man you guys are so awesome like why are you like this and he told me well we live under the threat of death constantly so we have to celebrate life and that's the other type of that's like the type of israeli that's been sold and uh then resold by guys like P- peter uh Beinart. Beinart, uh jeffrey goldberg the liberal zionist types who were able to trot this one out like you know Look, I don't like I don't approve of everything Israel does, but it's just that everything they do is literally to defend themselves. So I kind of do, but I'm saying that I don't. But they are literally the most endangered people on earth. And that was the way that you could kind of 
you could have uh, two streams coming out of the same urethra for a while. Yeah. <laughs> but it's impossible for them to do the second one now. A, they've just gone, they're just so openly right wing that, like, Beinart, like, he got detained he got trying to go to Israel. You yeah. can't even be a liberal Zionist anymore, which is fucking incredible. They've given up on that. Uh, in general, there has been this sort of, like, psychosis with uh, proxy states in that region. Saudi Arabia and Israel, where, that's, like, yeah, that's they, a can't, really good point. they can't have them. It's fucking mask off now. Well, they're responding to it by taking this kind of like reactionary anti-masculinity line. And like you see this a lot in the U.S. as well. You saw it with like the rise of the British Empire as well. You had these like massive, giant, um, powerful nations committing like excruciating acts. And like that the cultural response to it was like, yes, but the men are becoming more refined and learned and they're doing away with like the masculine ways or whatever. It's like the problem was never the fact that you liked sports and scratched your balls. It was really more of the colonialism thing. Well, but that that is like it is interesting, though, like this article is such an anachronism and anachronism to like, you know, two or three years ago because everything just moves so fucking fast now. But these imperial states Israel and Saudi Arabia are are proxies. They, I think, they're a bit responding to Trump and a bit responding just to their own internal decay, just mm-hmm. the psychosis mm-hmm. of being an ethno state or the psychosis of being a fucking monarchy, uh, where it just all the caution and procedure that you may have had, not obviously in what you do to your subjects, but in how you conduct yourself, how you make your way through the outside of the world, how you make your sales, it's gone away. Yeah. It's just psycho. You're telling Canada you're going to 9-11 then. Right? Yeah. You're fucking, Blowing up fucking school buses. You're taking out the strap on fucking Atlantic editors. <laughs> so it's this article no. is such it is it's sort of cute. I feel like I'm in 2014. But that that is Amber also brings up an interesting point. Uh, Don't call me macho. Don't worry, Shmuel. We're not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, like, can I just read this one thing? It, because it echoes what Amber's point was ex- identical to what you just said. He says, of course, Murad is, a more, a rep, is more a, represent, a representative of America's peculiarities than he is of Israel's. And what we learn from him is a little troubling. Israel's most avid supporters in America might like us more as crude machos than as startup entrepreneurs. They yeah. might even Don't worry, you know I hate both I would. of you. Yeah, 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 At yeah. least it's honest. Where is he getting the idea that these things are conf- in conflict with each other? But I, this is the other. Israel. The one makes the other possible. But one is a PR present. They're both PR presentations, and, and their argument is that this is an optics issue. This is the other Israeli thing I hate that just I love it doesn't drive me up the wall at all. The way where Israelis act like they're unfairly discriminated against by Americans. Yeah. They are just our, our, yeah. our AJ Soprano. <laughs> you're the reason, we're the reason you exist. We're the reason you're still there. But I think it speaks to that, that this weird, um, yeah, the kind of increasingly psychotic behavior. And I think Israel and Saudi Arabia are both very instructive in this because they are the two states that, basically have figured out that like especially now with Donald Trump as president like if they haven't figured like they they basically know that they are unrestrained by anything else in the world opinion as long as they have the United States backing they're going to keep doing whatever they want however they want and they basically know that like they can do anything to other people like uh, do a genocide in Yemen mow mow down fucking doctors and journalists fine they know America will never ever even gently reprimand them let alone cut off their military funding or uh, military support. So they have this, like they're now, they've now become basically incapable of even understanding what other countries might think about them or how the rest of the world opinion works or sees them. You know what it is? They're American now. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Yeah. We transferred it to them. Yeah, exactly. We transferred everything. It, it, came, it came along with it. It was like a, a virus, so, a contagion, like, along with all those but, fucking... But at the same time, like they may not be, they're, they're not worried about what anyone else in the world thinks. However, they are very concerned about what Americans think about them. Right. Right? Even though they the have like, the that government yeah. sewed up, I think particularly uh, Israel and Saudi Arabia, as we saw with their insane uh, Canada tweets last week, uh, oh they're really concerned about what American culture thinks of them, which is why I think even something sort of dumb and like the Sasha Baron Cohen... Israeli character, I think that's where they feel a need to make a response to it. I think that's why Shmuel feels compelled to write this article because the idea that uh, Israel could be satirized like that uh, so brilliantly by someone like Cohen, both to expose 
a caricature of Israeli culture, but in doing that, really create something where like what he's used that character to do is create something that allows the right wing in this country that can't resist showing their true selves to, yeah. you know, because they have this weird, they think Israeli Israel, Israel is macho too. And they respect them for that. Yeah. So like when Colonel, when the character says like, you know, we will show our, our, our dick to the terrorist and uh, we will suck them to show they hate to be gay, you know? And then, like, that's why he's getting all the, these, you know, Georgia, like, yeah, fuck Georgia yeah. state representatives yeah. to, like, you know, my moral sex with him or stuff like that. But, no, I think it speaks to the fact of how reliant they are on uh, U.S. support because it's the only thing that matters to them. So the idea that people could now be laughing at Israel... I think is very is more frightening to them than they want to let on. I I do have to say, as someone who's always giving very pessimistic cultural takes, you know, in the positive direction, I could not have conceived of a character like this and like a, something that's like a pretty big, pretty well received comedy just it's making true, fun yeah. of Israel so much. The last one I even remember like this in American comedy was the shitty Israeli counselor in Wet Hot American Summer. Yeah, that didn't even, oh, he you was know, great. Yeah. Touch the hilarious... I teach so good. It didn't even touch the funniness of Zionism. It was just like, oh yeah, this is just like a greasy type of yeah. gross Israeli guy. But this they're is... Just, they're just uh, Mediterranean sleazes. Yeah. It's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which, so, by the way, is fine. I really don't... Th this is also, I think, like, uh, kind of liberal feminism has obscured larger problems here. I, no one gives a shit if you go to beach and discotheque and, <laughs> and yalla. Like, no one gives a shit about that. It's really the uh, imperial project that's the problem, okay? Yes, Be macho meatheads. That's charming sometimes. I don't give a shit. It, yeah, it's like picking that... Po it is like really cherry picking the criticism, though, right? Yeah, exactly. it is like, oh, you know, I know everyone's yeah, mad. That's at the thing you notice. I know that everyone's mad at Israel right now. Like, it's true. We do have kind of a man spreading problem. <laughs> it, it's so good. It's so good. Yeah. So, let me just close out the article here with uh, Shmuel. He writes, and what about our own character? What about the possibility that without realizing it, we Israelis really are, are all morads? When I was working on this article, I called a friend of mine, a former paratrooper, to get his thoughts. Are there still a lot of Marad types in our country? I asked him. And then he gave he me shot the, his phone. <laughs> <laughs> and then he gave me the answer that made it all clear. He pulled my underwear right over my head. <laughs> He's like still writing articles, word boy. <laughs> every Israeli who serves in the military knows that we still have Marads. But for every idiotic Marad, we also have two prankish Cohens. That's why we can afford a laugh. Which one murdered everybody in the Gaza? Yeah. <laughs> I, was that a but prank? Like, I, li I like what he's closing out. Was, he was said, that just like a really hardcore really Home Alone-style deal with he, like paint cans hanging on string? <laughs> he's saying we can all afford a laugh at this, even though he's desperately trying to betray the oh, fact, yeah. not trying to betray the fact that he is deeply threatened by this uh, uh, satire of Israeli culture. He's deeply culture. threatened by the satire, and he's deeply threatened by Cohen, who is a more like intellectual and, I think, socially observant person than him by a mile. But he says, for, yeah, we, we have two prankish Cohens, and it's like he's saying, I'm that guy. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I'm the funny comedian. Oh God, uh, I've been known wish. to enjoy a joke. <laughs> An invented person in a Palestinian walking to a bar. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, uh, that was uh, that was Shmuel rounding out uh, this week's show. Uh, just doing some good uh, Israeli identity politics. Well, speaking yep. speaking of doomed identitarian nation projects, I have a plug. Go for it. Uh, Team Chapo FYM, the Twitch project we're under. Uh, who, our proxy state. Our proxy state. Um, Rhodesia for gamers. Uh, <laughs> we have a YouTube channel now. Woo -woo. We, we have a YouTube channel now. And God bless Aaron Bertovo on Twitter for curating some some really fun games, some really funny riffs, a uh, really, really funny game of Fortnite we had with Keith Buckley from Every Time I Die, who's on the stream sometimes. But we need your help. We need a 1,000 subscribers on that YouTube page so we can title it Something Offensive That Gets Us Banned. But we do need a page URL. We need a proper page. So please mm. subscribe to it if you're into gaming content. We'll put a link to one of the videos of the channel in the description to the show so you can do that. And but... whom among us does not enjoy a tubed yourself? <laughs> 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 That's right. But, uh, oh, also Metal Gear Stream probably coming this week. Again, right. 
<laughs> my back feels better now, and I move my setup to my couch so Will can come over and whoever else. Cool. Looking forward to it. Uh, yeah, no, there's the tour. Yeah. Uh, there are dates for that now. Yeah, there are dates. ChapoTrapHouse.com slash tour. Baby. Yeah. Um, Philly, it, D.C., Portland, Maine. Camden, what? Connecticut. Camden, Pawtucket, Connecticut. Rhode Island. Boston, Massachusetts. Baltimore, Philly, yep. D.C., Boston, New York. The whole, all, all your star, all the favorites. Let's all the go. Best towns. Oh, and I'll the, be uh, there. Oh, and the Chapo audio book, too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you, you're hearing it's like, it's like the book, but we read it. So it's like the podcast in book form. Oh, also, I am selling on my personal Etsy store a transcription of the audio book. <laughs> <laughs> All proceeds go to me. <laughs> okay, guys. Till next time.